there was no other way for the humanitarian community to be collecting or getting any kind of information from the disaster affected population. The systems were down back in Geneva and in New York at the UN. Nobody knew the extent of the impact. most powerful earthquake in the region's history has crippled the country measuring 7.0 I was sitting on my sofa it was about 5 p.m. the uh, earthquake had happened an hour earlier but I just then switched on the television and to CNN and I saw the breaking news there are reports of toppled buildings there we've seen pictures of some dead bodies in the streets there are reports of trapped victims screaming for help one aid worker told the AP I had some very very close friends in Port-au-Prince and I had no idea whether they were alive or dead and I just needed to do something. I needed to occupy myself with something, and mapping came very naturally to me. I said, maps are important. I'm going to go map as much as I can. I uh, picked up the phone and called our tech lead on Ushahidi and, and then asked him if he could you know, set up uh, the website with a map of Haiti and that in the meantime I'd go and start looking for information to map. I sent out an email to my friends at the Fletcher School and said, this is what I'm doing, I'm mapping tweets, can somebody come and help me? I had my calculus book open and I saw emails coming on the Fletcher network and talking about their Fletcher students in Haiti were mobilizing this platform and I said, wow, that's cool. <laughs> A bunch of people taking information from people actually on the ground in Haiti and putting them on a map so that relief organizations could take that information and actually give aid to the people that needed it. And I said, I want to do that. It felt like those ops rooms that you see, um, uh, you know, in spy movies maybe, you know, like an operation center and the, the nerve hub of some sort of, you know, powerful organization, but it was grad students <laughs> in a living room. Everybody was sort of sitting around on sofas, sitting on the floor. There wasn't really a lot of room. It was Patrick's small little living room and every space was covered in either people or pizza. Each of us was sleeping like two, three hours a day. And uh, so I was sleeping on that couch and then the whole day sitting on that couch working. People would forget to eat because everyone was focused on taking this information and putting it on the, the web as fast as we could. You know, Patrick kept saying that we were doing this in near real time and we were. One of the most successes and biggest outcomes of the first five days was that we were actually able to collect the GPS coordinates of locations that were most likely heavily affected, which means collapsed hospitals, collapsed schools. And uh, very soon we were sharing this spreadsheet and this GPS coordinates with some of the search and rescue teams on the ground. We were focusing on monitoring of any available sources of information at that time. So it was kind of like a passive, passive monitoring. Even before the earthquake, 1% of people in Haiti had access to the internet. 1% of people in Haiti were using a landline phone but close to 90% of people had access to a mobile phone and a cell network. And that's what we needed. Uh, we needed technology that would let us interact directly with people on the ground, trapped under rubble, needing emergency medical care. I put up a post on Twitter uh, that I was looking for someone to help set up an SMS gateway. Five minutes later, uh, someone from Cameroon, of all places, linked me up with an engineer on the ground in Haiti, also on Twitter. Five minutes after that, we exchanged Skype names. Ten minutes after that, he was at the command center for Digicel on the ground in Haiti. By that evening, we secured a short code, 4636.
the situation this morning, it's, it's worse than anyone could have imagined. There are wounded people walking through the streets. There are people seeking medical attention. There's still moans and cries coming out of um, the rubble. It's a, it's a horrible scene. catching a train back from Stanford campus to San Francisco when I sat down on the train, uh, pulled out my phone and read an email from Joss asking for my involvement. I'd never done that on this scale before. Uh, the last time I was doing this, it was in a grass hut in the Peruvian Amazon. Uh, with two people at a time and all of a sudden I was doing this uh, with thousands of people uh, across the world. None of this technology was new. Um, it was just the way that it all came together uh, which was new. And what had never been tried before was real-time translation uh, by crowdsourcing. And while certainly we predicted it would work, it was the biggest question mark uh, at, at the point of launch. You know, could we find the, the necessary volume of people to translate um, what was then going to be an unknown volume of, of text messages. Quarante-six, trente-six, c'est taper ce numéro, envoyer des des SMS pour pouvoir trouver de l'aide, des conseils et le train de vol. Uh, that Saturday night, got a couple hundred messages. More, more announcements went out the next morning, uh, got a couple hundred more messages, a couple hundred after that, and then the next day uh, bumped up to about a thousand. Really opened a floodgate. Toute la net, tout le rien, et puis tout le terrain net est chargé, tout le état qui était là. Je me suis des réclames pour 46, 36 là, et puis je me suis dit SMS bas haut, et puis je me suis dit que je vais aider, je vais aider là, mais sauf que... Je me suis dit que je vais aider, je vais aider, qui était jeune aide, donc moi-même, je fait me baptiser. Et puis, à l'instant, je fais ça. Je me présente comme victime, et puis après quelques minutes, on y relève. The US Coast Guard and the Marine Corps were taking every single actionable report we gave them um, and doing what they could with that information. And we trusted that, but we also got success stories back. Um, there was one particular case that um, really rallied uh, all of the workers involved, all of the volunteers in the Haitian diaspora. Um, a worker who went by the name Apo um, was actually from the area uh, where one of these messages came. Uh, he said, I know this place like my pocket, was the quote he gave. And he gave the latitude and longitude uh, that was correct to five decimal points for a woman who was bleeding out during labor. Ten minutes later, the U.S. Coast Guard was responding and assisted in birth. And, I mean, just that, um, I mean, you don't need much more. Jean-Olivier Neptune is caught under rubble of his fallen house. He is alive, but in very bad shape. Please, please, please hurry. One aid worker told the AP he fears there may be thousands of people dead, but any accurate number at this point is impossible to give you. So again, the scope of the damage, we simply do not know. My brother and his three daughters, aged two to six, are trapped inside one of the apartments. His wife can hear the baby cry. She's been waiting for help for the last 12 hours. The baby is crying. The quote was, no matter what anybody else tells you, do not stop mapping. That felt incredibly validating, but I think subconsciously what it did is put a, an incredible load of pressure on us. And we felt, oh my goodness, we've got to keep this up.
That was a stream of hundreds of messages a day that were really, really desperate. Like people really calling for help and sometimes not even not even requesting assistance, but just informing about the, about the situation. We had been desperately trying to find one location. Um, it was a man in Port-au-Prince standing next to what used to be his family's house. And his children had been killed, but he could hear his grandchildren still buried in the rubble. Um, and he had sent a number of messages to us uh, over several days, uh, every single one of them saying please, and then thanking us for doing all we could. By the time we were able to locate his house, um, within about a minute, we heard um, that the children had in fact passed away. When we saw that um, our message volume was going from a couple hundred to a couple thousand a day, um, we needed uh, to increase the number of people involved. A brilliant idea was to actually pay people on the ground in Haiti to do that work. Josh actually sent me a direct message on Twitter, was how it started. And so we teamed up with Lila uh, and Samosource. Um, and amazingly, they had just set a deal to establish a work center just outside of Port-au-Prince. Um, and so they had hundreds of Haitians who urgently wanted jobs. And our idea was we train these workers to translate messages. So it really became the system where messages, urgent needs were coming from Haitians and being process, processed by Haitians um, and creating jobs for Haitians. So it was just an amazing sort of synergy of technologies. It's really amazing. It's, it's showing us that we're shifting towards um, this, this movement to want to engage on a global scale. And so there are a couple of tools, right? One is the internet, you know, very plain and simple. Couldn't do this without the internet. Um, and the two is sort of these, well, the second enabling factor was that people cared in a very simple sense. And, um, you know, it would, this, the system would not have been stood up, would not have been maintained, and would not have been useful if people didn't care.